All right. And we are live with Gabriel. How are you, my friend? <laughs> very good. Very good. Thank you so much for, for having me here in your basement. In my basement. Yes, yes. It's, uh, <laughs> I made it look like a spaceship. <laughs> Sorry, you... it was a secret. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> well, it isn't anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, I like this. I like this. Uh, I'm, I'm getting used to this, this, this thing about connecting with people, not being able to see them. You know, it's, it's a little bit harder than real life, but but I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's, uh, I, I've now, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm on, I think I told, did, did, I, think I didn't tell you, but I'm on episode number 37 or 38. My goal has been every day to just release one interview. Um, and it's so much fun. It's so much fun. Okay. Well, so it, it's, I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. That, no, you're all, we are all missing those uh, good old days where we used to hang out in different conferences, explaining this dream to everyone. And, and now it's like, everyone alone so you know getting to chat and and, and get to be in touch again it's, it's awesome exactly exactly and you know and i was just mentioning earlier too is is that um when diego came up to one of my my last events that i did in toronto um it hit me during that time that the thing i enjoyed most was being able to connect with like-minded individuals and ask them questions and learn and and do that at scale you know be able to share that experience and and I realized that I don't need a hotel to do that anymore. <laughs> I can Absolutely. just do it using Zoom. <laughs> Anyways, so, uh, so, so let's get started. Okay, I like to start with where did we first meet? Um, I don't remember exactly, but do you recall? Was it something DCG related? I probably it was in, in the 2016. Uh, well, it was consensus at the time. It was not DCG family company at the time, I think. But probably mm. around there in 2016. The yes. Interesting. Maybe, no? I think so. I mean, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to remember. I mean, I, I, I you know, it's a little bit of a blur. But, uh, but okay. So, so as I was mentioning earlier, um, one of my goals is to try and kind of help. Um, not necessarily talk about the fact that Bitcoin's at an all-time high, which it is. <laughs> um, but, but more interestingly to me is. I find people's stories around Bitcoin to be fascinating in terms of before learning about Bitcoin and kind of after. And so, and, and, you know, I've been doing this now with people from like, you know, you introduced me to Rodolfo. And so he's from Argentina and there's people from India, there's people from Canada, from all over. And so I'm really enjoying kind of these like different perspectives um, and, and, and finding kind of the common threads that, that, that also exist. Uh, but anyway, let, let, let's, so let's start with yours. Like where, where does your story begin? Like where are you comfortable sharing? <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to, to share my story because I think it really defines uh, how, how Bitcoin hit me and how I understood and from where I, I understood this technology. Um, I, I lived all my life in, in Argentina, uh, middle class family, just going through major uh, economic crises all the time, uh, every 10 years, as everyone knows. Uh, so kind of the, the financial crisis is somehow embedded in the Argentine's DNA. So we, we are mm. always expecting something to go wrong in, in the financial system. You know, it's, it's, uh, the, every family has plenty of stories of people losing their homes because of hyperinflation, because they got a loan uh, or losing, taking the money out of the bank and getting robbed. So all kind of crazy stories uh, are super common for, for us in Argentina. Um, so, I, my, my, my mother is a, a chemist, my father is a, is a doctor, so I, I didn't know what to do when I was a, a teenager, I was in high school, so I decided to study economics, because they thought it was something uh, that could help me understand how the world uh, works and, and, and probably understand what my passion was farther along the, the, the road. You know? um, and, and something that when I, when I graduated from uh, university and I started looking for my first jobs, it was in 2001. So the, the major economic crisis in, uh, in the recent decades in Argentina, 2001. And I remember that, that I had my, my first uh, job in a multinational and I was always trying to find a path to get a salary that was based in US dollars at the time. So I understood uh, just 
still being very young that I didn't want to have my, my income in the future uh, back to the Argentine peso because I heard so many stories. Interesting. And, and that's something that is embedded in, in, in every uh, Argentine. We understand that we cannot save in a local currency, that it devaluates all the time, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, but you get that feeling that, that you don't like your national currency. Uh, so then I, I kept my corporate career, uh, working for a few multinationals in corporate finance, and then I arrived to private equity. So I joined this US fund. Uh, I was working in deals in Latin America, and then uh, I went to, to the UK to do a fundraising for this organization. So we put together a very important fund in 2008. So I was living in London in the middle of the 2008 crisis, which also was a very interesting way to, to see uh, the crisis unfolding from, from London. So um, after that, I came back to, to Argentina and I really wanted to become an entrepreneur. So I took the, the whole experience of working for different corporations as a learning process, and I, but I didn't know what to do. And in 2013, a friend of a friend uh, told me, did you realize that there is a Bitcoin conference happening in Buenos Aires, the first one in Latin America? And I just learned about Bitcoin a couple of months before. Uh, I found it super interesting. But it was very hard for me with, without the technical background to understand whether it was, this was a real thing or not. So I went to the Bitcoin in Buenos Aires in 2013. Let me cut a little bit. So I do you have a noise? There's a background noise here. Yeah, yeah, I have a little bit. You want to pause it? Okay, so we, we, we're back here. But we have some intruders. Okay, what's your dog's name? Bartolo. And this is Eva. Hi, say hello. Hola, Eva. Hey, Bartolo. Foggy. Say hi. Oh, Look, Bartolo. Oh, wow. Hi, and, this is, and this is Mia. Come here, Mia. Hello, Mia. Uh, they just came to say hi. They're going to go upstairs now. All right. See you guys later. Bye. Bye. Right. Thank you. You're beautiful. <laughs> and so Bartolo is quite famous here in, in the Uruguay community as well. Uh, he participated in a few meetups. Oh, so you say that again? Your dog is? Bartolo, yeah. Yeah? yeah? <laughs> Got to get him. Actually, I remember like when I first started doing events in Toronto, when Mia was like, I don't know, one, I would just take her on stage with me and yeah, introduce exactly. you know, whoever the next guest. Um, for them, Bitcoin's kind of like, it's like all in one. <laughs> um, okay, so, so, so anyway, so you were saying, um, do you remember where you were? Yeah, so I learned about La Bitcoin in 2013. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and, and, and I signed up for the conference. I didn't really know what to expect. And it was from a uh, full Saturday and a full Sunday. And, and by the time that Sunday night ended, I had my, my mind it was exploding. I, I had absorbed so much information. I didn't know what to start. I... Um, I started talking to everyone and, and started to figure out how can I get into this? This is, this is something amazing. I love the technology. So uh, Rodolfo and Franco and Diguito were the host of that amazing conference uh, that I think it opened the eyes and, and the minds of so many of us in, in, in Latin America and in, in Argentina. Uh, we had speakers from all around the world. Uh, and, and after that, I, I met Dieguito, we started doing projects together, uh, several, several of them uh, completely non-for-profit, non such as uh, Blockchain for Humanity, La Bitcoineta, uh, La Bitcoin, this conference that, that then we kept on running together with all the other volunteers for so many years. Uh, and it's been a, a, a wild ride since then. But everything for me started at, at La Bitcoin, where I finally understood that there was something that I felt that was wrong in, 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 in the world, in the financial system. And, and that there was actually a possible solution to it. But I didn't know there was something wrong until I saw the solution. And, and, and looking back, there was one moment that something happened to me in my life that I was working in, in this uh, private equity fund and we were trying to do uh, an LBO, a leverage buyout in Argentina. And an international bank offered us 
hundreds of millions at extremely low interest rates with five, day, five years of grace without paying anything to acquire that company. And during that week, I, as an individual, was trying to buy my first house. So I went to a bank to get a mortgage. And the conditions that I was receiving were completely different, much worse than the ones that we were receiving as an organization to acquire a $100 million uh, you know, company. So that's when I understood for the first time why we have so much inequality in the world and, and, and why this will eventually lead to a change. It's because the system is it, it, wrongly programmed. The economic, the economic incentives of the system we live in drive us to a polarization in equity and in, in wealth because it's much easier to make a lot of money when you have a lot of money than when you have nothing. Um, so it, it was really frustrating for me because it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how much you want to help. Like the system is built to sink. You know, the, the system is built what do you mean by that? So like, wh what insights did you have at that time that led you to believe that it's, you know, the cards are stacked up against the smaller guy? That I, my, that, that I myself, as an individual, was getting a much higher interest rate and a very mm. small amount of the asset that I was trying to buy than me as part of a corporation with billions of dollars under management trying to acquire a massive company. So the leverage that the buyout was getting was much better than the leverage that the small guy could get to buy a house. Uh, and this applies to everything. I mean, in, in Argentina, the, the pensioners and the policemen and, and the firemen, they can get extremely uh, easy loans because it's like no risk. No, you, you, the, the ones providing the loans collect uh, the loan directly from their paychecks. So it's zero risk. Still, they pay incredibly high uh, interest rates for those loans with zero risk. And the reason is because there is no competition because they have to accept that or they're done. You know? And I started dreaming, you know, if we could build a financial system where the rules, like the, the, the fabric on which the financial system is built, uh, create incentives, economic incentives, to promote decentralization, to promote that the smaller guy gets better or more fair conditions than the big corporation that we're trying to, um, you know, they, you get the economics of scale working towards large organizations, we need somehow to balance that. And, and that's what I, what I saw in, in Bitcoin and blockchain technology on top of Bitcoin is the possibility of uh, building a portfolio where billions of small loans distributed across Africa and Latin America uh, based on, on, on a portfolio could, could be more diversified, have lower risk of default and hence driving a lower interest rate to those small guys distributed uh, among millions of, of uh, you know, different parts of the world versus the concentration of capital that this late capitalism is creating uh, with, the, with the stock buybacks and, and how, you know, what we are living now with this massive quantitative easing and, and you know, that extra money being used to, to drive shares up, which only affect a tiny percent of the population in the world. Uh, so, this is what, what blew my mind from, from a Bitcoin standpoint. I yeah, I have a question for you. So you said you studied economics um, and then you came to Bitcoin and or you came to the Bitcoin event and was you know struck by the idea. But curious, like, wasn't there a disconnect there? Because like in, in your school, were they teaching things like um, Austrian economics or was it more focused on kind of the traditional, you know, very uh, little, Keynesian? Very little, very little. Yeah, uh, in, in my university, it was pretty much a uh, Keynesian approach. Um, and you need to understand that I, I studied in the, in the University of Buenos Aires, which is the, the public school 
or high um, university in Argentina. And they, you know, we, we saw Marxism, we saw um, you know, more and more liberal ideas, uh, but there was this concept of the need for, you know, the, the permanent support and, and how we can, uh, you know, protect a Latin American economy from the major powers in the world and, and how you cannot let the market uh, free because the markets are not free and, and you have corporations with geopolitical powers trying to basically overtake uh, emerging markets as you know they would do in, in the backyard. So it, it, there's, there's a part that I resonate with that in the sense that, that I think we actively need to reshape the, the balance of power in the world that we cannot leave everything to the market. But I was very upset with my university because they never taught me how, um, you know, the abandonment of um, the convertibility of the dollar in 1971 was the, the largest default and scam in the world. And that basically we gave the US the role of printing, uh, you know, whatever they wanted to, to control the world. And, and no one ever made us doubt whether that was good or bad or sustainable or the only way going forward. Um, so we never questioned the value of the dollar ever. Um, and I think that was, that was, uh, that, that is something that I would encourage every single university in economics to do to their students, especially in Argentina and the emerging markets, because I, I've done many talks in, in, in universities and it's very hard to convince them that you know, the, the dollar is not the ultimate store of value. And when you prove uh, how the, the US dollar has been losing value over time and how quantitative easing now will lead uh, inevitably to, to, to very high inflation as it happens in Argentina, Venezuela and the rest of the world, it's very hard for people to understand. They, they, they just live in a different paradigm where they cannot see what's going on. I'm curious, when did that leap hap for, happen for you? Did it happen at that conference or were you kind of already studying a bit of like this, this, like, you know, uh, this type of economics before? No, I, I started reading more about Eastern economics afterwards. After, right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And I, I felt like, am I an economist? How come I, I, I never paid attention to this? I mean, I, I read the books at the time when I was studying, but I didn't really pay attention because they seemed something old that it was, you know, needed to learn to understand how things work now. Mm. Uh, and, and also a part of me, uh, you know, kind of um, question those ideas in the sense that by understanding that, that we need a free market of uh, money or store of value, that sometimes gets drawn to then the free market is the best for everything and uh, the initial conditions don't matter and now you know let the market decide and, and let the poorest country in the world compete in terms of uh, productivity with with the us that have been printing money for free for 50 years you know so it's sometimes i i feel that i don't fit in any theory that that there is no one individual truth that that i could uh, put put my hands on, right? uh, and and that's why I also enjoy this this uh, new idea of you know in, in the Bitcoin maximalism uh, spectrum. Considering myself a Bitcoin mutant, you know this idea that that you can be really maximalist and Austrian in 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 the base layer, in the store of value, in the way you want. Bitcoin governance to be uh, because you appreciate the anti-fragility of it. And, but then at the same time, uh, this philosophy might not apply to upper layers where you want innovation, where you want uh, proactively help those in need if the ultimate goal is to, to leave in behind a society that is bit better than, than the one we found. So that also um, is something that, that I that I like to discuss and, and, and stress sometimes that 
I mean, I, if, because of my own story, because I was working in private equity before, um, sometimes I see exactly the same approach to, to human society, to life, to, to the market, uh, from maximalist Bitcoiners uh, than I used to see in, in my pri private equity life. You know, it's like, if we only care about maximizing profits, if we only care about being more successful than the guy next to us, if we only care, then we're not doing anything revolutionary at the end. I don't think the, the Bitcoin revolution or the blockchain revolution has to do with the technology. I believe the, the revolution that at least that at least drives me and turns me on is the possibility of being able to code a better future, no? to code uh, the financial system in a way that it naturally contributes to the decentralization and to help us, you know, build the society that we dream on based on the economic incentives. Satoshi taught us that. You know, if you have the economic incentives in the right way, then, uh, you know, just the, the, the fate will go towards that. It's just an entropy thing. If, if you put the rules in such a way, then uh, individuals will, will act accordingly. And, and I think we should be able, we have the responsibility now because the technology enables us to do it, to code a financial system and, and in a social system and a democratic system where the economic incentives are built in such a way that it leads us toward a better society like the, the the one we have today i believe it drives us to to the extinction to the through ai through global warming it's maximizing profits as a, as a unique uh, driver of, of human uh, motivation I, I think it's it's unhealthy for everyone and and i think Bitcoin might, might give us a tool to do something different in this regard. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, especially the, the comment around Bitcoin mutant, I thought was really interesting. But before we go there, I wanted to make sure, so in terms of the storyline, right? Um, like in terms of, you know, you grew up in Argentina, you, you, you obviously like just from birth had this like instinctive reaction towards the monetary system, had lots of question marks, if you will, uh, go to London in hopes that maybe the solution is outside your border, but then you see the crisis and say, oh my God, it, this is even worse outside, which helps you eventually to realize that maybe the US dollar isn't even, uh, you know, the, the North Star here, maybe there's more. Um, I, I, you know, you said you studied economy. I'm curious, like, were you also touched by the, the computer bug? Like, were you like, did you have a computer at an early age? Did you have a fascination with it? Or did that come later? Do you even have it any, any at this point? I don't know. Like, what's your, yes. with just computers in general? <laughs> so I, like, I'm the older brother, right? So sometimes I think younger brothers have that, you know, uh, lead way that, that, you know, older brothers can teach them stuff. Um, I, I, I took classes of logo, you know, the little turtle that was uh, drawing stuff when I was a kid, but then I never caught into programming. I wish I had, I wish my mother would have forced me to do it. Uh, but I always found computers, um, you know, difficult to understand. And it was more from a user standpoint that from, uh, you know, getting my hands dirty in programming stuff. So. I, I usually use this in the sense that if I've been able to understand blockchain and how it works and, and its potential, then every everybody can. Uh, but I I always seen uh, the the IT world from from the outside, and uh, I'm still trusting on, on our technical teams and, and uh, our ecosystem and, and our partners to to really. Uh, help me understand and, and Sergio and, and Diego and Adrian, Ruben as well, they play a key role in making me understand from a non-technical uh, mindset, uh, how our technology works and how they fit in, in the whole ecosystem. But yeah, I, I, I understand the, the, how, how the software works, but I cannot code it at all. 
so your fascination was always more with like money and economics and and so you kind of came to it with that lens so so take us back to that then that conference so where you meet diego and all these guys it's super exciting what happens after that so you're like okay bitcoin seems like a fascinating space but how do you fit in exactly it was it, it was not easy to understand it, it at some point it seemed like i was too late you know that everything was invented already i think everyone yeah. had that that feeling and then this is too too large i mean where where do i start and then uh, so the only thing i knew was how to put together a fund because that was my my prior experience so we started helping uh you know vcs local vcs to understand the value of this and and investing in bitcoin we spent and this like, is in we, london or we, no, in argentina, argentina in, okay, in Latin okay, okay. America, yeah. yeah yeah and we spent 90 percent of our time just explaining bitcoin to people that was actually i mean at the end that was our, our, our job um and, and it really opened hundreds of relationships of people that now are very grateful and, and happy that it, that they learned about bitcoin those early days uh, but it was not in our DNA. So the, the, the money management part of it, the speculative part of it, it was kind of the only thing that could be done at the time with, with cryptocurrencies. Uh, we, we had the technological knowledge to understand the value of each of them. It was a stellar at the time uh, that we like, uh, it was a store J. Um, and, course like in dodge do you know uh in in but always bitcoin was the, the the one that we understood that had uh a technology that that could really be a breakthrough and play a key role in in the future of human time so um as soon as ethereum launched their white paper in, and then their technology in 2015 uh we already had in mind that what we were looking was to build solutions that could serve billions of users around the world. And, and we need the programmability beyond uh, the Bitcoin script. Um, so when, when Ethereum launched, uh, I remember Diego explaining to me what the difference between Ethereum and, and Bitcoin were. And, and, and it was very clear at the beginning that we didn't want to choose. I mean, if we wanted to build a financial system to serve the hundreds of millions of unbanked in Latin America, we needed Bitcoin security and smart contract programmability. We, we didn't want to choose between one or the other. And it was kind of frustrating seeing that we were Bitcoiners, we understood the true value of, of Bitcoin as a store of value, an alternative to gold, but then all smart contract solutions at the time could only be built on, on Ethereum that had a completely different um, proof of work and plans to move away from proof of work. Um, so we had a, a very interesting conversation with Nick Savo in San Francisco, a uh, friend in, in common introduced us to, to Nick. And, and Nick told Diego, you guys should, uh, should get together with Sergio Lerner and his team uh, that was quite known at the time for, for his uh, help on, on the Ethereum uh, security audit and the Bitcoin Foundation, the US security audits. And, and built Ethereum for Bitcoin. And, and we took that challenge from, from, from Nick and, and that's how RSK and Rustock was born um, with this idea, you know, Bitcoiners willing to build the future of the financial system secured by Bitcoin infrastructure and built on top of Bitcoin. It was, it was kind of, very natural for us. It was a piece that was missing in the space. Um, I, I couldn't imagine, um, you know, Bitcoiners staying happy and pegged to their store of value uh, as alternative to gold and, and used in, in reserves in central banks and replacing gold and not being the possibility of, of making it programmable of creating stable coins using that Bitcoin as collateral and building all the dimensions of a fully decentralized financial system with the programmability needed and the scalability to serve billions of users that are currently excluded. 
which is the real revolution for us. If we can serve those users in a fully open financial system that is so efficient and so uh, easy to use that you know savvy investors and you know the small guy in the corner of the planet can have the same the same service at the same cost and that is what is really revolutionary in, and that's why we need decentralization in order to be able to achieve this without the legacy system forbidding us to serve that that guy um, so that's how rsk the, the idea was born and and, and, um, and also we paid a lot of attention to the economic incentives in a way that you know satoshi taught us that in order for someone to be successful for, for a project to be successful uh it's, it makes sure that everyone supports it because the economic incentives are built in such a way that everyone benefits from its success as it happens with, with Bitcoin. Uh, and that's why we created RSK in a way that every single stakeholder benefits if RSK is successful. So, okay, so, so let's, let's maybe back up a little bit in the sense that I have an interesting perspective in the sense that it's like, you know, I was, I'm in Toronto. So I got to see Vitalik and Anthony and them come together and build Ethereum to some extent, just from as an outsider. Um, and, and from what I recall, Vitalik's criticism was that Bitcoin will never allow this type of, um, you know, Swiss army knife like capability, this Turing completeness, this ability to execute, you know, like the full set of kind of, uh, you know, code, if you will, right on top of the blockchain. And therefore he diverged and said, okay, I'm going to create my own, you know, blockchain in itself. Right. Um, but I guess my first question is, is like, that that I guess some could say insight, some could say maybe you know lack thereof. Um, but therein lies that kind of fork in the road, right? Between kind of RSK and Ethereum. So really curious, like what obstacles did he see at the time that in your in your experience were validated, and maybe maybe some that are that are I don't know less so. You, do you know kind of what I'm getting at here? Like absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and. And I, that something that I love is that every technology that we're building is open source and available to the ecosystem to keep on building on it, no? And that's something that most people maybe don't even know or realize, right? Like that, that's crazy. Like the fact that everything is open source means that we're allowed to do, we don't have to ask anyone for permission. We can do all of what we want. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and that it's a key pillar of the revolution because it makes code and information um, you know, a uh, human right, and it, it's it's available for everyone. So if anyone has a better idea, wants to take this uh, step forward, they can just take the code and do it. And and I think it's very important that in this environment, everyone is very respectful and grateful of those who came before, because there's a ton of work in everything that we do and we use in our code that it's being recycled, you know, from many different minds. Uh, before it. And I think that's something that, that happened to, to RSK and we were extremely lucky and grateful because when, when Vitalik was building Ethereum, the concept of sidechains didn't exist. So, so he couldn't build it as a Bitcoin sidechain because that was created later. Yeah? So uh, merge mining existed at the time, but not the, the sidechain concept. And, and what we did as in RSK was just you know, taking the most interesting technologies available in this space and just blending them together into RSK. Uh, I've been talking to, to developers very much involved in the early days of Ethereum and, and they tried very hard to get Ethereum built on top of Bitcoin, but, but I think Vitalik had, had a point that there was no way that Bitcoin Core would compromise the security of the base layer and the decentralization of the base layer in order to add additional functionality. And, and I think that is kind of right as well. I mean, it, it, the, the, the store of value that Bitcoin can provide to, to society, no other cryptocurrency can, can fulfill that role. So we need to protect that as much as we can. 
Now with the sidechain concepts where you can borrow the native token Bitcoin and use it as native token of a sidechain in the case of RSK as RBTC or smart Bitcoin enables you to, to use that uh, token uh, as you know, the native store of value of your sidechain. And through merge mining, we can enable Bitcoin miners to provide the same level of security to the smart contract execution than they are providing to the Bitcoin layer at zero cost with extra fees. So again, it's a no brainer. If RSK is successful, we are making Bitcoin miners more successful. Bitcoiners are more successful because it applies more Bitcoins locked in, in the peg and hence a higher demand for Bitcoin. But we also wanted to make it fully compatible with Solidity and with all the methods of uh, used by, by projects on Ethereum, because we also thought that having multiple alternatives was better for the project. So if you're building a, a multi-million dollar project, a DeFi project, uh, and you know that your fate is subject to the fate of your underlying infrastructure layer. So if you can have three different infrastructures and make sure that your customers will continue to be served with the highest level of security at the lowest cost, then your project is better with multiple infrastructures than just with one, especially if that one is going to go through major changes. Ethereum is, is about to happen uh, or to go. So uh, we, been always very uh, thankful to, to, to Vitalik and all the founders of Ethereum because we used their code to build uh, RSK. Uh, we also uh, offer and shared many uh, security bags that we found to their teams before making them public. This is something that Sergio has been doing all his life. So everything that we do and every improvement on RSK, it's also made available to, to the Ethereum community so they can use it in, in their blockchain as well. And I, I think after all these years, we've created a very close relationship with the Ethereum Foundation, with different projects from the Ethereum ecosystem that uh, are super happy to be blockchain agnostic. We've been working together a lot with the Swarm team, with Chainlink that else is bringing now through the RSK Ethereum bridge, our link on RSK to use the oracles on RSK. Uh, with the MakerDAO team, they are making uh, a lot of DAI available now on RSK through the bridge as well. And we believe that the, the real challenge here is how we can serve 3 billion users and take them out of poverty with, with this technology. And the, the higher the chance we have is if we're working all together, uh, making a, an ecosystem that is fully interoperable where the focus is put on, on the user and how we can serve with, with great technology and extremely high security standards, all these new millions of users that are coming to, to the system. Um, so I think back to your question on, 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 on Vitalik, I think we were lucky in the sense that there were technologies that were not ready at the time that we had when we launched RSK a year later. Uh, and also, um, you know, several scalability solutions that Sergio proposed as part of his um, security audit of Ethereum, uh, we were able to introduce them to RSK and they are, some have been already introduced and some are coming soon with um, the Lumino compression protocol uh, and uh, the sync change technology, even sharding, it's uh, part of the RSK roadmap now. But we've been able to add these scalability solutions such as Lumino also for off-chain payments before the RSK blockchain got bloated. So, so we could cope with the transition into more scalability without the need of throwing the, the blockchain away as Ethereum is doing now with 1.0. Um, Explain how that works. So, so I have a question. What is your, so I think what you said at the earlier part of this conversation is, is that pr you like the idea of not only building on top of Bitcoin, but also the fact that it was proof of work and you knew that back in the day they, they were going to move to proof of stake. So what, 
Um, what are the criticisms, I guess, against proof of stake? Um, and, and now that it's gone live, I mean, are, are there any or have they kind of, I guess, proved um, some of the naysayers wrong? I mean, I, I'll be honest, like I'm not <clears throat> even maybe technically savvy enough to really uh, understand and kind of see the, you know, the forest through the trees or what is it? I don't even know what the saying is. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Absolutely. So I, I think it's, um, and this is my opinion, okay? So I, I, I'm open to, to debate, but I, I think uh, proof of work is something that only Bitcoin will be able to afford. No, it's super expensive. It's super secure. And, and, and as you can see in the top 20 tokens in the world, I mean, only a couple are proof of work and, and more and more are happening to, to be like EOS or proof of stake because not because they want to, not because they care about the, the, the ecosystem, it's, it's because they cannot afford it. See what, what happens to, to Ethereum Classic with the attacks, it's extremely expensive to afford a proof of work. So what I think in the future, only Bitcoin will be able to afford proof of work and Bitcoin sidechains that have been built, you know, benefiting from, from that security. So Ethereum, in my opinion, if they would have found a way to continue proof of work um, and, and, and scale, you know, with, with different sharding and, and techni technological solutions, but maintaining a connection to proof of work that makes sure their blockchain is fully immutable uh, and cannot be changed uh, and cannot be attacked, uh, I think they, they they would. I mean, if at some point proof of, of stake or any other consensus protocol proves to be better than proof of stake, uh, I think we're going to be the first ones moving to that new consensus mechanism. We, if there's something that we are, in our case, very pragmatic. Now, our real commitment right now is to serving these 3 billion users with the highest level of security at the lowest possible cost. And we believe that the best way to do it is through mixing, mixing scalability solutions on multiple second and third layers with Bitcoin proof of work. Um, so going to proof of stake, I think from it's, there, you have the technological challenge and then you have the social, the social challenge as it happened to EOS, you know, when, when you have uh, you know, people having the stake deciding the fate of the of the blockchain, then you 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 have all kinds of social attacks to it. When you, by concentrating the power and the decision making, you can basically reverse the blockchain, or you have to see what kind of consensus you have um, to vote new upgrades. You know how much people are actually willing to participate in the governance of the network or not. Uh, what the role of exchanges will be. You know, sometimes exchanges held uh, a big part of the, of the tokens actually decide in the governance. So you can have them, um, you know, governance pools or delegating your governance to it. And I think there's a long way for everyone in the space to prove that a proof of stake or delegated proof of stake uh, blockchain can really handle trillions of dollars worth of value as we need in order to serve these billions of, of users. So kind of, I, I think the question should be the opposite, should be uh, even if innovation is amazing and we should explore different alternatives to proof of work, uh, no one should move away from proof of work unless we have something which is definitely much better or you have no option. And I think Ethereum has no option right now because of the fees that they have in, in, in their network. So I understand their path and kind of rushing it and, and risking it to proof of work, uh, stake. Uh, the way we built RSK was to avoid uh, that need and, and to make sure that we are taking the security from Bitcoin and adding uh, additional functionality that is fully compatible with that security on the base layer. But talk, okay, this is so fascinating. Um, but talk to me a bit about what's fundamentally happening here, because 
because with mining and I, and I, I mine, you know, at a very small scale way back in the day, but with mining, you're effectively turning energy <clears throat> and information processing into Bitcoin. And you're doing it through this proof of work mechanism in proof of stake. You're doing it through, like you said, through, you know, people who hold uh, this asset or whatever, right? Crypto asset. What's fundamentally happening there? Like how are the economic systems like, or the incentive systems different? And have you ever heard of something called the Gini coefficient? I just recently heard about this thing, but everyone keeps talking to me about it, but it's super fascinating. And I just recently heard that like Ethereum, along with every other crypto asset, along with every other fiat currency is trending higher, whereas Bitcoin is is, is trending lower. I, have you seen, I, don't, I haven't seen any of the, like the graphs no, or no. charts, but I found that fascinating. And, and so talk to me a little bit about what's actually fundamentally happening here. Cause it's a bit like, you know, it's like a bit hand wavy and it's hard to understand because there are other platforms that have made proof of stake work. I mean, to, to what extent it could be argued, but it, they are, like you said, EOS or other ones that are out there in the wild, you know? So, so yeah. So help me. Anyways, I don't know. Maybe I'm just going to shut up right now. I'm kind of peppering you with a lot of questions here, but, but you know what I'm getting at? Yes. I, and, and again, I, I don't trust humans, right? So the whole purpose of Satoshi was not to trust humans. One computer, you know, one Oh, didn't he, is that said somewhere or am I, or no, anyways, or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Continue. Continue. Yeah. Yes. Not to trust humans. You got me on that one. I like that. Exactly. And, and, and when you have a proof of stake, uh, I mean, you create a bounty there for all kind of social interactions and game theory on how you can gain power based on multiple uh, actions that you can play around. So, you know, accumulating voting rights, playing on how many of the actual votes happen or not. Uh, the, I, I, I think it's fascinating that we are exploring new consensus mechanisms. And I don't want to sound as I am discouraging innovation because this is the part of the, part of the mutant that I actually love the most. I want projects to innovate. I want uh, projects to try new open source technologies. And whenever we find we find something that is a breakthrough and mind blowing, we're gonna adopt it across the, the board. And 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 I think in that sense, I, I try to be more towards the, the Bitcoin philosophy on, on on how conservative we should be on this. Uh, Bitcoin and RSK and Money on Chain, which is a stable coin with collateral in, in Bitcoin, launch on RSK is being used by very poor families across Latin America and the rest of the world. And we cannot play around with their funds. We, we cannot explore technological new ideas on production while you know, they're counting on these to protect their life savings from inflation in Venezuela or in Argentina. So I, I would put the bar extremely high on what proof of stake needs to, to prove and show the world. Uh, hmm. And why not every single solution should be a, a Bitcoin sidechain. So I, I think uh, it depends on, on how successful RSK uh, is, and probably other sidechains as well, such as Liquid. Uh, and, and, and also I'm very excited to see, you know, how the adoption of the Lightning Network happens. There's a part of my brain that believes that everything that is not linked or connected somehow with Bitcoin will end up fading away because everything can be copied and ported into Bitcoin. So every breakthrough, every NFT, every crazy idea that you can see can always be ported into a Bitcoin sidechain. So it's like, you know, it, having it, the it, coolest it, intranet in the night is like, who cares? I mean, you need to be interconnected with the most secure uh, network and the, with the most stable uh, and valuable asset. And that's going to be in Bitcoin, taking Bitcoin and wrapping up into another network that is less secure. Why? If you can use those same lending tools on RSK on top of Bitcoin and, and no, so it's about 
at, at the time when when all these technologies started start to, to really create noise and eat market share from major players, decentralization will be tested. And, and I think probably only Bitcoin sidechains will be able to go through that threshold and, and continue offering global solution available to everyone. But we'll see. It's it's. It, I mean, it's so difficult to predict. Is this is just? I mean, belief. yeah, 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 yeah. Very, very fascinating. Hey, let's go back to the RS. Sorry, I kind of took us on a tangent and then threw you into like the the hot waters here. But uh, but let's go back to the story of RSK. So, what is the story there? In the sense that, uh, so you guys had so when Ethereum launched, and what year was that? 2015, 16 or something 15, like that, right? Yes. 15. So then you guys see this and you're like, okay, people in Latin America, all these places need that kind of capability, but on a much more, what you believed um, is much more robust. I mean, I don't think that's up for argument. It's, it's true that it's like in terms from a security perspective and all that decentralization perspective, it still is kind of king on that front. Um, and, and the question mark is still out there. And you're right. The onus is on, I guess, the others to prove that they are as robust, that that's an also, I think, very interesting counterpoint. So, but, but what, what happens in terms of the story? So how do you guys, you have this insight, you're like, okay, we, we, we think that we're onto something here. Um, how do you connect the dots? I mean, you have some like, like legends type of like, like you, you, <laughs> you name Mick Zabo, um, you know, Sergey. I mean, these are guys that have been, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, how do you, how do you connect the dots on that? Was it was Diego, so, yeah, like, so was Diego, it, Diego yeah. started the Latin American Beacon community. So he was... Okay, okay can, sorry, sorry. Can I just say one thing? Okay, my wife's from Colombia. So when I, when I was going to all the meetups, wherever I go, I was literally told when I first heard about Diego, he was introduced to me as the godfather of, of Bitcoin in Latin America. This is in another country far away. That, I was like, who is this Diego guy? I got to meet this guy. Well, anyway, sorry. You know, the thing, you, the I had thing to... is that Dieguito, Dieguito was... <laughs> A, a cornerstone of the the internet uh, revolution in Argentina back in the nineties when he was a teenager, and and he always was fascinated about the community building around open source technology, and when he got across Bitcoin, he saw exactly the same. So they said we need to put together a, a, a regional community around this technology to make sure that Latin America plays a key role. In, in this revolution, it's not just another follower as, as we were in the, you know, in the building of the Internet of Information. So I think that that spirit is what would really penetrate in the whole region. And, and I, I don't know if you agree, but the, the community that we have in Latin America is unique in the world. There is no this level of community bonding and friendship uh, among, you know, 25 different countries in the world all gather around La Bitconf. I don't see this in Canada. I don't see this in, in, in the US. I don't see this in, in, in Asia, in Europe. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that technical difficulty. But yeah, continue. You were saying. So yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I had heard about him as like the godfather of like the Bitcoin movement, you know, and this was in Colombia. So uh, his reputation really does, you know, precede itself. Um, and so, yeah, so continue. And, so I guess, how did, yeah, how did all the dots connect eventually for and, you and guys? I think, and I think that reputation comes from the spirit of, of helping other entrepreneurs to mm. build. Uh, so almost every project in Latin America, some, in Latin America somehow has been affected by La Bitcoin, coached by anyone or, or open, you know, possibilities. Uh, we decided to take La Bitcoin to a different country every year to help the local community. So we did it in Brazil, we did it in Mexico, in Colombia, in Chile, in Uruguay, uh, to really create a, a regional movement. And, and I think it really played out. And when the, when the time we presented the, um, the, the RSK white paper in Mexico in 2015, um, people already knew this theme. And, and they've seen what we've been doing at the community level before understanding that we were going to build RSK. And that was something that, that the, the ecosystem really appreciated and gave RSK a, a lot of love. And actually many, many people say RSK comes from a really strong karma because uh, I think it's, it's a combination of uh, a real social purpose behind it 
beyond the technology, uh, building it in a way that it's in line with the values of, uh, you know, all of us that, that joined Bitcoin because there was something that, that we didn't see in the traditional system. So building it in, in, in a different way and more seeing ourselves as a community and as a, as a global society than individual projects where the success of all of us is connected and based on, on how fast and how well we reach mass adoption of these tools. Um, so the, the community, and, and I would like to, to thank everyone that has been supporting RSK for all these years, uh, from the miners providing the security through merge mining to the exchanges, uh, you know, listing and being part of the ecosystem and, and the entrepreneurs that have decided to dedicate their, their lives to build on top of RSK, uh, which are like uh, 50 projects right now. Some of them starting to, to have a lot of adoption and, and amazing growth. Uh, so I think RSK has been building very slowly over five years. And now we're starting to, to see the results of all that hard work um, with a hashing power that uh, it's close to 60% of total Bitcoin uh, hash rate. This is mind blowing. It's, it's beyond our wildest dreams. Uh, and, and we keep on growing, so we expect to be closer to 80% soon. Um, so yeah, it's been a wild ride. I have a question. So do you, um, so, Obviously that, obviously, okay, so first of all, before we even get into that, RSK, we keep referring to it as RSK. You just referred to it as really strong karma, but I don't think we've actually said the word rootstock yet, right? So, so just, do you want to maybe quickly share, I mean, where that, where that name comes yeah. from? I mean, I've been to the website, so I've seen it, but like, do you want to share a little bit on that before we move into, back into deep waters? <laughs> Absolutely, because it's very important. Uh, everything has a meaning. So, when we were thinking on how to call this project, uh, we came up with the concept of a rootstock, you know, a rhizome. A rhizome is a type of plant that looks like different plants from the outside, but it's only one root system underground. And we immediately saw a correlation to a blockchain and how it works where you have different use cases all secured by the same infrastructure. Uh, in, in, in our case, overall attached to, to Bitcoin as a core security underground. And this is also what the RSK logo represents, you know, as a rhizome with the different nodes and then different leaves are the use cases that, that flourish from that ecosystem. Uh, and we, Sergio wrote the, the white paper and, and we put it as a title, Rootstock, because this is the, and we started the registration process of the brand. In that week, we received a letter uh, from a US company saying that you cannot use this. We have it registered for software. And it was really sad for us because we really liked the name. It, it had a meaning. Um, but in the meantime, we sent the white paper to Nick Sabo. A year after that meeting, we came up with the white paper. We told him, Nick, please don't share it. It's just for you. What do you think? And the next day, Nick tweeted, the best of both worlds, Bitcoin plus Ethereum equals Rootstock. And, and we had like thousands of visits to our website and, and we were, you know, off to the ecosystem and everyone learned about Rootstock through Nick. But we didn't have time to tell Nick that we had to change the name. <laughs> I was, I was, so we really love the fact that Nick was so excited and shared it, but we yeah. had to change the name. I think a lot of people probably don't even know about Nick Zabo too, right? So it should be noted that I, I, I was just reading Ethereum's white paper again recently, and I think he's referenced Nick in there, but in the first couple he's of paragraphs. In, in, she, he's referenced on Bitcoin's white paper. Satoshi reference. Nick is yeah. Nick is rep okay. I knew Adam Back was referenced. I didn't know Nick yes, Zabo was. Nick I knew he was well, like part of that that day, but I didn't know he was actually referenced. Oh, sweet. Okay. Yes, and he's the founder of uh, interesting the concept of smart contracts. He he was the first one. To right. That's what I was gonna get at. Okay, so he is the idea. Okay, so so he sees your white paper and he's like, okay, this is this is pretty cool. This is cool. <laughs> um. Okay, and then what what? Okay, so what? Uh, 
So he treated it and, and, and everybody started asking about our uh, Rustog and everybody loved Rustog and they said, okay, now we, we need to change the name, you know, this is... Uh, hey, hey, what's Nick's, I mean, I, maybe I should interview him. I'd love to, by the way, I got to ping him. But he, what's Nick's perspective on Ethereum? Like, has he come out and kind of like released anything public on it or? So I don't know recently. Uh, I What I know is that he's been a very strong supporter of RSK and Rustock from, from the beginning. He really liked this idea of building uh, Turing complete functionality on top of Bitcoin as, a, as an additional layer to expand Bitcoin uh, possibilities, uh, but, but not building it completely from scratch outside. Um, so yeah, it, he, I think he, he's very much in line with our vision of building Turing complete smart contracts on top of Bitcoin. That's what he said. Publicly. And, and you, okay, so this is pink elephant that I'm like, oh, I gotta ask this. Which is like, what what is the biggest? Would you say criticism or bottleneck right now about the project? And how do you, you know, kind of envision the team or the community overcoming that? And I'm talking more about like. Because there is, there is like, you know, I, I and I, maybe we need a bit of maybe okay. back context in terms of like what side chains are a bit, a bit more. Maybe, I, maybe it's lack of uh, my understanding, but, but really around like how decentral is RSK, right? Because I even recently I can't quote it, but like Vitalik had some, some comments around, you know, I think it was Samson Mao or all these guys around Liquid and Blockstream saying, hey, look, you know, the reason your company even exists is because of the lack of, you know, ability to bring functionality to um, Bitcoin, right? And so I'm wondering, like, if Vitalik was on this call, which he's not, obviously, but like, what, what are the criticisms that people lay on you guys? And then, like I said, like, around centralization and how there are maybe a set number of nodes that, that you know, kind of enable all of this functionality. And, and yeah, I guess, what are, what are kind of the responses yeah, yeah, to that? Absolutely. absolutely. So as I said before, RSK is connected to Bitcoin in two different ways. Right. One is through merge mining and the other one is through the native token, you know, using Bitcoin as native token on RSK. So the merge mining part is fully decentralized and it's growing. And, and when we have like more than 60 percent, it's really almost impossible to do an attack on, on, on RSK unless you do an attack on, on Bitcoin. Um, so this is one side which is extremely important and, and it's the only Bitcoin sidechain secured by merge mining. So this is, you know, something to, to keep in mind when you're also analyzing other Bitcoin sidechains. Now, the two-way peg part where you take Bitcoins, put them in a, in a locking account, you release the same amount of smart Bitcoins that you use for DeFi on Bitcoin on RSK and for paying for gas and everything. And then you send back to the peg and you release the Bitcoins that were locked in the first place. Okay. This is, it's called the peg and it has multiple uh, releases and versions until we reach a fully decentralized solution. The fully decentralized one, it's called a drive chain. And that one needs one opcode to be uh, included on, on Bitcoin, that it could be included as a soft fork. So it doesn't need a Bitcoin hard fork, but it requires something to be changed in the repo at Bitcoin Core. And we presented- but, but that, that, that thing, sorry, just, can we just pause yeah. on that? That Because I always kind of heard, I don't know through where, but I heard that, that Turing completeness was always available in Bitcoin, but Satoshi or someone early on decided that it was an attack vector and decided to maybe not expose it. Is that true? Is that untrue? Is like, is, and, and what is what you're talking about related to this? Can you talk no, to me a bit, no. little bit about like, what, like, it, it, like the, my first gut reaction to say is, is if you introduce this op code, is it going to like, again, open up a window no, of attacks that maybe, can no, no, you speak no. to that? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, so so your question about how to get Turing complete and whether Satoshi wanted Turing complete on Bitcoin or not, uh, I'm not capable of answering that. But even if you have Turing complete on Bitcoin, you will still have blocks every 10 minutes. So, you know, and, and the throughput of the Bitcoin network. So for, from a technological standpoint, having Turing complete on a second layer, uh, as far as I understand, is much better. Uh, the opcode the drive chain requires, it's to release 
the bitcoins that are locked on the Bitcoin blockchain when you use the drive chain, when you use the, the peg. Got so you. going from Bitcoin to RSK is fully decentralized. But when you go from RSK to Bitcoin, you need someone to sign a multisig because Bitcoin is not programmable. It's not an RSK problem. It's how you come back to Bitcoin, who signs that multisig in Bitcoin, right? And given that everything is open source, you cannot put the private keys in a smart contract because then you can, you can read the private keys, okay? So there are different layers of decentralization. There's a path to decentralization, to full decentralization of the peg. And we are about to start a new milestone uh, that will be announced uh, in a couple of weeks uh, that is called the Po peg, which is having a peg where the pegnatories, the ones that sign this multi-sig, can only sign a transaction that is coming from the bridge that is also secure by the proof of work of Bitcoin. So it reduces significantly the level of centralization of the peg that we currently have, the 1.0, we're moving to the 2.0. Then there is a version uh, 3.0, which includes a second federation from the miners. So you'd have two federations balancing each other and preventing an attack from the, the Peg, um, pegnatories and from the miners on the other side. And then the, the final version, the 4.0 is a drive chain that requires Bitcoin Core to make a small change that should not add any security. Our vision is that by the time we reach V2 and V3, there's gonna be so much value under management and so much potential value coming to Bitcoin from RSK that Bitcoin Core will be more than happy to include that opcode, which basically eliminates the need of a federation of mining pools directly the miners vote every time they mine a new block. So let's say you need 100 confirmations to release the funds in that multi-sig account. And every time a mining pool mines a new block, they confirm this transaction is valid, the transaction is valid, and after 100 blocks, the funds are released in a fully decentralized manner. So uh, I like the criticisms that uh, the, the PEG 1.0 received because we agree with them. And, and decentralization is not an option. Unless we are fully decentralized, uh, the, the, the project will not succeed. And this applies to, to, to any stable coin or any open source technology that is fully permissionless where you can have any kind of projects uh, running their solutions. And, and the only way to survive is when, when no one can control it. Um, I think the 2.0, the POPEC uh, that will be announced very soon is, is an amazing breakthrough that makes the, the, the whole um, project even more decentralized. And as I said before, it's the second step of a four steps process where we aim as soon as possible to have a protocol that is fully decentralized with no control from uh, any uh, party uh, whatsoever. Okay, and so Gabriel, I, I, I have a question for you. So being, I know it's maybe hard, but like to try and be subjective right in this moment, at this given point in time, if somebody was like, I want the most, the least chance of, you know, my project being subverted, being taken down or whatever. I want to build something forever. Um, at this point in time, would you say that Ethereum is more decentralized because of whatever, whatever, or would you say that RSK is? Like, you know what I mean? Like you guys, you made a bet back, you know, five years ago that this was innovative, but you were going to go a different route. You obviously couldn't see into the future. But I'm just curious, like at this point in time, if you're looking at those two worlds, like what what variables do you even assess them upon and and and, and do you so, guys still feel like no 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 like this is going to happen because because i mean i can understand like working with bitcoin core must be difficult too because they have their mandate and they're kind of like laser focused and getting new things introduced is not necessarily easy but but yeah but i'm just curious like at this snapshot yeah, so, in time where are we so so my recommendation to any project building a smart contract based solution is that they have to be blockchain agnostic 
I mean, with the level of uncertainty that is happening in the space right now, because we are so early in the process, uh, fixing, fixing the fate of your project on a particular infrastructure seems to me like a very poor management decision from the leaders of a project. Uh, you want to be flexible. You want to make sure that your DeFi solution or whatever the solution you are building will serve millions of users extremely securely and with a very low cost. And the way that all the EVMs are, are built makes it so easy for you to make sure that your solution, your Oracle, your DeFi application runs on multiple infrastructures and can use Ethereum 1, uh, can use Ethereum 2, can use RSK with the user seamlessly using your application without knowing what they're doing. Uh, that would be my recommendation. I wouldn't bet on my project based on the fate of Ethereum 2.0. Uh, and, and I wouldn't, uh, I mean, why would you, if you don't have to choose, you can just- But what do you mean by that? So you're saying that someone who's trying to build let's say like something like Uniswap or I don't know, something, right? Some new DeFi project, you're saying that they should be building on both platforms simultaneously? Like what? I mm. mean, Uniswap has been forked and there's a project called RSK Swap that mm. enables swapping in the same way for all the RSK tokens. There's a text, you have a money on chain that enables collateral with Bitcoin. You have sovereign uh, that enables lending and margin trading. So every single solution that has been built on is running on Ethereum can be deployed and run in RSK seamlessly. And that can be done by a third party that takes the code and run it or by the same project, uh, you know, willing to serve also the Bitcoin community on RSK. And because there are, there are many Bitcoiners that are now starting to understand the potential of DeFi and, and you know, derivatives and financial services that can be built on top of smart contracts, but they want to build that on top of Bitcoin because it, it keeps their economic incentives in line because they want to see their Bitcoin grow in value, but also because they, they believe in the values of Bitcoin and they want to build on a base layer that is fully decentralized without the Satoshi, the public Satoshi. So there is, uh, you know, this organic growth of solutions uh, being built on RSK from Bitcoiners, uh, for Bitcoiners, by Bitcoiners. And, and if I would be a solution running on Ethereum, I would say like, I don't want to, to miss this market opportunity. I want to make sure that my solution also is available for Bitcoiners that are using RSK. Uh, or they want to use a stable coin that has Bitcoin as collateral and not uh, US dollars, no? So- um, Fascinating, interesting. That's, that, that's my answer. Mm. Just become blockchain agnostic and, and, and use whatever platform can offer you the highest level. Of oh, hey Gavin, I think I lost you. Is that my side or your side? No, 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 sorry, it was my side. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And, I, and I'm saying this because, you know, we, we are running on top of Bitcoin. So we have a, a big chance of being able to provide the highest level of security at the lowest cost, because we are free riding on, on Bitcoin and giving value back to the Bitcoin network because of that security that we're taking. Yeah. Okay. So this has been, a, I didn't even realize that it's all already been nine, almost 90 minutes. Uh, I thought it was like five minutes in or something. Uh, no, I'm kidding. No, I, I, I didn't, I did, definitely didn't realize it was that far in. Uh, this has been very intellectually stimulating. Look, if you, I mean, I know you don't have time for it, nor would I want you to, but if you were to look through my last 35 videos, I think one out of every three I'm bringing up, I'm like, have you heard about RSK? Like, why aren't people talking about RSK? I do believe that what you guys are on to might be the most like underrated project that I don't hear enough about. And so I'm, I'm so super happy that we got to do this interview and maybe we could do a follow-up one. And I'd love to go down some of these rabbit holes because you're definitely shedding a lot of light um, and things that I didn't even know. And 
like, you know, Unicoin's got a million and a half customers. Um, you know, maybe if we join forces, India's got a lot of programmers. We can encourage more people to build, you know, on top of Ethereum as well, but, but ideally on top of RSK because you get all the benefits of, of, like you said, the Bitcoin security and, and all of that. And so, uh, and then like you said, I mean, both, why not? Okay. Um, I know we only have a few minutes left, but do you have the contrarian belief question that I kind of prepped you on earlier? So anything on that? I mean, you again, you've already touched on, I think just the idea of solidity or something like, you know, Turing complete on top of Bitcoin is in itself a bit contrarian, but anything, I mean, you could even double down on that one, but anything else on, on that front that, that you, any truth that you hold to be true that most other Bitcoiners would disagree with you on? Uh, apart from being a vegetarian, uh, the, the, I, don't, I, I don't know why, who mixed the, 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 the paleo culture with Bitcoin, what's going on, I'm trying to build a better world, and, and that's kind of, it's full of vegetables, not, not cows. Yeah, stuff. I like vegetables, I, I like vegetables. Exactly. Yeah. Um, no, I, I think uh, something that, that is, it's not contrarian, but it's something that, that I think, you know, um, People that have the chance to to reach uh, thousands of uh, users and, and a big audience as, as you are because of your network and, and in your program, these interviews now, is we need to explain and, and convince people around the world that what this technology really is, this is a possibility to code a better world. Uh, if the outcome of Bitcoin and blockchain technology is just more of the same. And in the same, I mean that, that the people from India continue to be this poor. The people in Latin America continue to have uh, not the same possibilities of success of someone with a different skin color or that has born, been born and raised in a different family. Then I think we are missing a huge opportunity. I really believe that it's not about the technology, that the technology is not an, an end by itself. Uh, I think it's, it's a mean, as I said before, to build the fabric of a new society uh, that has a more holistic way of thinking, uh, that cares about sustainability of the Leave. Oh, sorry, you were muted there for half a second. Yeah, sustainability. And, and, and how our, our friends uh, and, and communities live and, and caring, willing to build something that is more fair. And, and I think many Bitcoiners and many people joining crypto come through the speculative investment, uh, you know, um, idea, which I think is, is, is very fair and, and valuable, but I really enjoy when I see them staying for the revolution. You know, when they, they come because they, they were running from inflation, they were trying to protect their savings, they wanted to do a good investment. But then they remembered that, that when they were children, there was something different they were dreaming. They, were, they wanted to be superheroes, they wanted to be astronauts, they wanted to, to push humanity forward. And, and every time I give a talk and I talk to people that are getting new into the space, I try to share this vision. That is, in my opinion, much more rewarding than the, the financial benefits of holding Bitcoin and, and, and you know, increasing your wealth. It's, it's a reason why so many Bitcoiners or blockchain entrepreneurs you know, stay for decades in the space and keep on building because there's something more about it. Uh, and, and I think it's related to this, to, to the fact that if we are smart enough and if we have the right you know, incentives from the heart, if we really want to, to, to before we die, I know you're gonna live forever, but for the rest of us, uh, you know, by the time we die, you say like we left something that was that was worth building because it helped the world. And and I think never 
more than now, the world needed to be healed. And the world needed to have a, a group of entrepreneurs willing to code a better society. And I think this is something that we should stress. Every hey, Gabriel, you're muted again. Sorry, you just muted there for half a second. Wait, you were just on the pinnacle of like a mic drop moment. Okay, sorry, continue. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I think, I think it's very important that we, that we share this with the, the newcomers to the space and we inspire people uh, because a better society won't happen by accident. So there are so many powerful organizations uh, and interests around the world willing to build a dystopian future that uh, we need the best of us building technology that will counterbalance uh, you know, that, that potential future. So I think this is the most inspired thing uh, about Bitcoin and about blockchain and, and about Ethereum and RSK. And I really love when I find people from all around the world with different backgrounds, as you said at the beginning, uh, that we get together and we connect and we become friends because we have a shared dream, uh, which is helping to build a better world. So this, this is what I, what I love the most about this space. Yeah, well, my show, I'm calling it Bitcoin Stories, but on my, my top, the header is called Building on Bitcoin. And so I can't think of a more appropriate person to be talking to right now than, than you guys, right? And, and I really believe like just thinking through this hard technical problem of like, how do you enable Bitcoin security, but the Swiss army knife Turing completeness of something like Ethereum is a very, very noble cause. Where can people learn more about you, you know, the website um, and then, you know, things like that before, before, yeah, before I let you go here. But again, dude, if you want to do this again, I'd be even down to do like a weekly or a monthly or anything special where we do screen shares and we go into the code. Maybe you get some of your more technical guys to, to, you know, because I'll, I'll introduce, really peel back the yes, I'll introduce you also to some of these amazing projects that are building on RSK. Because it's it, you, you're gonna yes. really enjoy talking to Bitcoiners, building solidity solutions. One hundred percent, one hundred percent. They're, obs they, they're obsessed with security. <laughs> they're obsessed with decentralization. They they have a, a clear mm. plan on how these uh, these solutions need to be and unstoppable and unbreakable. So I'll, I'll introduce you. Uh, I'm cool. also gonna gonna looking forward to see your presentation at La Bitconf uh, next week. Yep. I'll be there. Thanks uh, to you. That, yep. That's yes. Gonna be I'm excited about awesome. that. <laughs> and thank you so much for your time, for having me here. Uh, congratulations on the, on the show. And let's keep on building on Bitcoin. Beautiful. Okay. I'm going to end.